what were the Crusades? We have to understand the idea of the Crusade, which is, of course, in today's parlance, we use the word Crusade like some kind of grand venture to improve something, like you can have a crusade for the environment, or you can have a crusade for, uh, I don't know, uh, literacy or something like that. Uh, the term, of course, comes from the word cross. It's related to the word crux, and uh, because the the crusaders themselves uh, were traveling under the sign of the cross on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, the, art, the history is basically like this. In the year 1095, uh, Israel was under the control of the Muslims, and uh, there was a significant conflict between the Muslim Empire and the Byzantine Empire on, in Constantinople. And the uh, the Byzantine Empire, of course, was Christian. And the although there was a significant split between the Western Christians, who became Roman Catholics, and the Byzantine Christians, the leader of the Byzantine Christians in Constantinople, now called Istanbul, reached out to the Pope in Rome, shown here, Urban II, and said, can you help us out? we are finding that we cannot make our way to the holy sites in Jerusalem on our pilgrimages. And so Urban II, uh, when he was in France, he called together a council, and in 1095 he proclaimed a grand Europe-wide crusade, a gathering of military forces to march all the way to Jerusalem and to take it from the infidel, the non-believer, meaning the Muslim in this case. Uh, it was a, an audacious goal. Uh, we're talking about highly fractionated communities, uh, Christians who are already arguing with each other. There was a grand ecumenical motive behind it because here were the Orthodox Christians calling out to the Catholic Christians. They were going to cooperate in this grand, vest, you know, um, adventure. There are also lots of economic and political advantages to doing this. They actually had at the time a glut of young knights at a particular uh, rung in the feudal ladder that needed to have some kind of uh, activity to occupy them. I'm not kidding you. There's a lot of this going on. But at any rate, the, the enterprise caught fire. People loved the idea and sure enough, they organized themselves all across Europe, and they made their way in a series of crusades. There was not just one, finally down to Jerusalem, where they attacked it and conquered it in 1099, establishing for a very brief period of time, and uh, with some interruptions, a crusader presence in Israel. As you can see from this map here, uh, they uh, not all of the crusades succeeded, and in fact, much of the First Crusade, which is especially important for us, was actually uh, brought to its knees not by Muslim defenders, but by Christians who refused to allow the Crusaders to pass through their territory. Uh, and quite uh, frequently along the way, the Crusaders traveled past uh, Jewish settlements. So you can see all of the uh, Stars of David here represent uh, larger Jewish communities. Um, and uh, the green uh, path in particular is important to us. At the top right there, you see that uh, it, it goes through uh, northeastern, northwestern Europe, which is where uh, much of the story we're going to describe here today happened. So that's the idea of the Crusades. They finally get moving in ten, early 1096, and by 1099, they, they conquer and take over Jerusalem. Now, uh, what this means for the Jews is that there were a huge number of massacres, particularly in the Rhineland. And scholars of the Crusades often overlook this because they tend to think of the Crusaders in terms of the, um, the high-level, well-outfitted professional soldiers from the soldiering class who uh, undertook this massive journey, Richard the Lionheart type people. But in reality, there were several uh, stages or waves of crusaders that had different levels of uh, 
social attachment to that class. Um, and um, in fact, in quite in when you get to the the lowest level of crusaders, you had basically uh, hoodlums and ne'er do wells, and just uh, decided to uh, join on to this cause. Uh, some of them were, you know, kind of stoked by the uh, rhetoric of people like Peter the Hermit, shown here, uh, who was, uh, you know, directing people that goose, uh, a given goose, or in one case, a donkey was actually, you know, infused with the Holy Spirit. And Peter the Hermit went around sort of like stoking people's uh, excitement and energy, saying, we have to follow the Crusaders all the way to Jerusalem, meaning you've got like real official soldiers who have armor and they have a horse and they have a squire and then you have just people who are like yeah count me in i'm there uh, and they have no provisions and they have no money and and how are they going to cross europe without actually um uh, having any of these things to their name uh, here's another image of peter the hermit on the left who was kind of uh, directing the crusaders to their uh, goal in jerusalem that's uh, depicted on the right this is from a 13th century uh, piece of art another image of Peter the Hermit, you know, directing the Crusaders as they, they head off. But in reality, Peter the Hermit was not directing the Crusaders. He was typically following behind them, but inspiring the masses to engage in various activity. Now, in terms of the Jews, uh, many of these sort of lower level Crusaders, followers of Peter the Hermit and the others, they said, wait a second, why are we schlepping all the way to Jerusalem to defeat the non-believer, meaning the Muslims, we have non-believers living right here in the Rhineland Valley. Why do we have to go all the way over there when we can attack the Jews and we can fulfill the sort of religious mandate of the Crusades by attacking uh, our local uh, infidels? Three communities in particular were devastated, amongst about a dozen. Speyer, Worms, and Mines, uh, known as the community Shum. Uh, quite often you'll have little tri-towns, three towns that have uh, close associations and they're geographically proximate and they tend to have an acronym like Shum does. These particular towns were the epicenter of these massacres by these sort of ragtag bands associated with the Crusades. Why this becomes so important in Jewish history is largely because of the nature of the Jewish response. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, devastation on the scale of the 19th, certainly not the 20th century. We're speaking about somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 8,000 people killed, which is a terrible tragedy, no question. But it's a relatively small number when you think about you know, 50,000 in the 17th century and 6 million just in the middle of the 20th century. But they nevertheless had a very powerful impact on the fairly young community of Ashkenaz that we'll discuss in a moment and in the next lecture. Hopefully we'll have time. So the Crusades, let's go through them a little bit more detail. And these, by the way, um, the, the, the peak season was right around this time of year. Uh, the worst attacks were uh, days before and after the holiday of Shavuot in 1096. There are actually a lot of very powerful uh, pieces of the liturgy that specifically remember that and are associated with the uh, um, Tisha B'Av, the National Day of Mourning as well. So the Crusaders, again, not the official soldier Crusaders, but the uh, uh, these ragtag bands were in the neighborhood of Cologne, in April of 20, 1096, and the Jews of that community were quite afraid that there would be violence. So they attempted to um, respond to an advance by being proactive and providing contributions. In the case of Peter the Hermit, who was there at the time, uh, they offered to provision his followers, meaning the Jewish community of Cologne said, oh, look at all you hungry, tired crusaders. Let us take care of catering you while you make your way down to Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, Peter the Hermits uh, accepted on their behalf. Another one of the more official crusaders, Geoffrey de Boyon, uh, he accepted a contribution of 500 gold pieces to uh, maintain his troops as well. So contributions, quote-unquote, 
as a kind of a bribe to hopefully avert disaster. It was actually temporarily successful, also because the um, the uh, the Jewish community of Cologne also appealed to the emperor, who uh, clearly gave instructions to local officials that there was to be no violence directed against the Jews in that time. As we shall see, the uh, the emperor who was positively disposed towards the Jewish community was not able to control the violence, it gives you a sense of, of the uh, the nature of medieval society as a whole. So that's what happened essentially in Köln. But neighboring Jewish communities were worried because these crusaders are, are making their way along to their communities. Um, and uh, they're worried about the little, you know, isolated acts of violence that they associate with this mob. In the next town, in Speyer, the Jews were much more worried because by the time the Crusaders got there, they were more... And by the way, let me reiterate that official historians of the Crusades tend not to regard the, the, the follows, the, the also Crusaded mobs as Crusaders themselves. And indeed, they were quite distinct. This is like mob violence that's following the... Uh, you know, the, the, the larger zeitgeist and the larger movement in society at the time. But in Speyer, uh, the Jews uh, attempted to uh, barricade themselves in the synagogue, um, hoping that they could, uh, you know, just simply ride out the violence. The, the mob actually went into Speyer, they, and they, uh, they found 11 Jews who were not able to make it into the synagogue, and they were killed. Uh, and it was at this point that we have something that is especially unique about the Crusades that has, I think, profound impact for the rest of Ashkenazic history. Uh, the Crusaders, even this mob, uh, had kind of like a filmy covering of religious justification for their behavior, uh, <laughs> saying that the Jews were liable to be attacked because they were fundamentally unbelievers. If, however, they were to convert and accept baptism, that would make them believers, and then uh, they uh, would be would save themselves. And so uh, the Crusaders frequently offered the Jews the choice of baptism or death. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the difficulty in Christian theology, especially medieval Catholic theology, about forced baptism. Uh, in general, the church frowned on forced baptism uh, because after all it's it's supposed to be something that is done with you know intent and if you're fearful for your life it's hard to say that you have uh, correct intent but once baptism was performed the church was also loath to declare it null and void uh, we also spoke a few weeks ago about the horrible Edgardo Mortara case, where even as late as 1858, you still have this kind of terrible situation. At any rate, in Speyer, you have the first example. And by the way, we have a number of uh, very solid first-hand accounts that survived the Crusades. There, there's a, about half a dozen significant uh, narratives from both the Jewish and the non-Jewish perspective on how these events unfolded. So we actually have a, a lot of, um, of good material to base this history on. I will refer you to the works of Robert Chazen, who's written extensively on the Crusades. It was inspired that the, uh, the first uh, known case of uh, a woman, uh, given the choice of baptism or, baptism or death, decided to choose death. Uh, martyrdom, or as it's called in Hebrew, Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of the name. And uh, this is a phenomenon that would be associated indelibly with the Crusades and in much larger numbers. When they got to Worms, which is again one of those tri towns, the Jews sought refuge with the bishop. And this is something that we see over and over again in the Crusades. The church was not the enemy at all here. The church was, in fact, against the violence. And although they definitely uh, approved of the larger goal of the Crusades, attacking the local Jews was not something that the church uh, officially sanctioned at all. It was more of a, uh, a mass movement that came from uh, strange characters like Peter the Great, uh, Peter the Hermit. So the the Jews sought refuge in the bishops. Uh, compound, and in fact, the uh, the Crusaders broke into the bishop's palace themselves and massacred the Jews in his home. 
uh, a quite a large number, about 800 Jews, died this way. And Worms had a, a terrible, terrible situation where the Jews over and over again, uh, many of them, we do have numbers of Jews who chose baptism, we'll return to them in a second, but you have these terrible, awful incidents of uh, Jews, you know, trapped in a room and fearful of having the synagogue set alight and dying in the flames or or fearful of having them break in and, and uh, the, the Jews not being able to withstand the temptation and deciding to convert uh, on pain of death, where many of these Jewish families and communities simply decided to kill each other in acts of mass suicide. Very powerful, poignant descriptions of mothers killing their own children and fathers killing their daughters-in-law and just horrible, horrible things to read that uh, literally formed part of the liturgy for Jews for centuries afterwards in memory of this event, which was called, incidentally, Gzerat Tatnu, the, uh, the decree of 1096. In Mainz, the bishop attempted to help, but he did not have the wherewithal to, to do so. And you had an incredible number there of, of massacres. Perhaps the most powerful examples of massacres and suicides were in Mainz. The, the rough estimate of the number of deaths is about 5,000. And when you include the, the surrounding communities, it might go up a little bit more. Uh, another one of these figures who was kind of like Peter the Hermit is Count Amico. He eventually moved on. It was his troops who were later destroyed by the Hungarians. And one last detail that's quite significant. Uh, after this horrible summer of 1096, the emperor actually uh, officially allowed any baptized Jews to simply ignore their forced baptism and return to the Jewish community. Uh, there was a papal conflict at this time, and the so-called anti-pope Clement III was very upset with the emperor, but at this point, the church did not have the authority to challenge him, especially not a, uh, a, a disputed pope, and so therefore the, uh, the Jews were allowed to return to their faith by secular law. Also interesting to note is that the, uh, the Jewish community had to deal with this question of are these baptized Jews allowed to come back to Judaism? Uh, Rashi and others, of course, uh, answered in the affirmative that they were welcomed back, but it was a subject of debate. And there's just a new monograph that came out recently, I believe, by uh, Professor Karnafogel. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that and knowing a little bit more about the story. But at any rate, it was like this massive wave of violence that swept over the Rhineland in association with the uh, Crusades, and it had a, a very distinct impact on the Jews. Before we spend a little more time uh, looking at the uh, impact on Ashkenaz, let's just follow the Crusaders down to Jerusalem, where uh, they finally put siege to the holy city in the summer, in June of 1099. Uh, the Jewish community actually defended Jerusalem side by side with the dominant Muslim population, but after a brutal siege, uh, the walls were breached and uh, the Jews in Jerusalem were massacred. Uh, many were actually sold into slavery and uh, only redeemed uh, when they, the slave ships dropped them off at Italy and the Jewish community there was able to um, take them out of slavery. An absolutely horrific massacre. Now, obviously, there's huge geopolitical implications to the Crusades because this was a major point in the uh, cleaving of Europe between the Christian North and the Muslim South. Uh, the separation uh, politically and culturally and intellectually of Christians and Muslims continues right up until the present day. In fact, one of the, uh, I'm told, one of the slang derogatory terms for Americans uh, in Iraq is uh, crusader. That, uh, you know, the, the, the Muslims definitely have the crusades as a very important part of their historical memory, and it's not a complimentary one to the West.